Just get right into it. Tony, what what is going on with this defense, man? What are you seeing? So I'm all I'm all, all about getting right into it. Let's let's get to let's get let's, let's get right to business. Uh, you guys don't want to talk to debate. I know that's on tonight, but uh, we need to debate what's going on with the Dallas Cowboys defense. You know what? I, I think I'm the surprise as much as anyone. I I think every year we we speculate. Uh, we're very excited about what the year may bring. Um, we've seen some of the changes have been made. Uh, new uh, head coach, new off, excuse me, new defensive coordinator. Obviously, new offensive coordinator, but was there last year. Um, so I think there was a lot of expectations. I think the problem is is that I don't think that we expect them, them to. Uh, the energy aspect of it, if you will, the playing soft, as Demarcus Lawrence referred to earlier this week and just to give up that many points and look anytime you give up 300 yards rushing I know 85 yards is a big play by Odell Beckham Jr. which to me should have never happened um, I think it's very perplexing I just think that when you you, you you go in the season you have these expectations you don't realize what you have until you get there mm -hmm. and especially in, in, in the secondary I think you look at the secondary to me, they're young. I mean, they don't have a leader in the back end. Um, but I think the biggest surprise is up front. I, you know, look, I'm all for giving guys a, an opportunity to get their rhythm going and let them get three or four games under their belt. And we can all talk about this COVID. But every other team in the National Football League is having to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And there's guys in the National Football There are teams in the National Football League that are balling on the defensive side. So now I think they just need to find a way to pivot. And... Honestly, guys, right now, they are just not that good uh, from top to bottom. And mm -hmm. we can start whichever position you want to because we, I don't know, we have about an hour or 30 minutes. We can talk whatever <laughs> you want about that. But it may not be long enough. But there's, there's multiple issues on that side of the ball. Yeah. Zach, what are you seeing from – from your perspective, what's what's going on with this team or defense specifically? Well, I think for, for me, the biggest disappointment has to be the pass rush. You know, I, I think we expected the secondary to struggle, but I think we were excited when you sign an Everson Griffin, who's had a really good career with the Minnesota Vikings, uh, coming in, in here was, was going to be able to provide you some pass rush. I was high on Alden Smith as well. I thought he was just a guy that has a knack for getting after the quarterback, and he's got a multitude of ways to set up offensive linemen. I expected him to come in and make an impact, which fortunately, you know, that's probably about the one thing I got right this preseason. He's made me look somewhat <laughs> smart for doing that. But Tony, you know, Chris Arnold and myself had you on our show in the offseason. And one thing we were excited about was the additions they'd made along the interior of the defensive line, your former position at defensive tackle. And obviously the Gerald McCoy injury was a big blow. But even Dontari Poe, you know, we were excited. You finally get a big body in the middle. And maybe he'd be able to be a space eater, allow your linebackers uh, some opportunity to roam free, get offensive linemen off of them. But the interior of the defensive line, outside of maybe Tristan Hill, has been very, very underwhelming. And that includes Tyron Crawford, who we were excited to get back as well off a of hip surgery. I'm curious your thoughts there on the defensive tackle position, specifically Dontari Poe, who might be one of the more disappointing players in terms of offseason additions this team made. And I'm surprised they're waiting you know, at this point to give him criticism because I, you know, I watch him play and he is pretty much pedestrian. And you saw last week against the Cleveland Browns. I mean, as a team, they look, they got running backs. I mean, you got their offensive line was running downhill and just didn't have a, you know, just didn't have an answer to that. And Don Terry Poe, he was a highly regarded. He was the guy's coach to come in here. And as you mentioned, he's a run stopper. And not only that, he's, you know, he can be multiple you know, he can have he can be a dull threat and and more he's more of a run stopper but the point is is that you haven't heard much about him he hasn't gotten the criticism i think you're right about the pass rush i i really i and, and look guys hate to hit criticism uh, guys love to when they have two million followers on instagram or twitter they love when everything's going their way but all of a sudden when you're being the pig you know you're being paid big money 20 million dollars a year People expect big results. I'm sorry. It's a big boy league. And and I think, uh, you know, Demarcus Lawrence, I don't know if he's hurt. And, you know, I think Demarcus is a great dude. I got a chance to meet him about four years ago before he came this multimillionaire. And um, so I don't know what's going on there. But across the board, and you made a point about Alden Smith. What Alden Smith 
And I think it's great to see Tristan Hill really start to be very active. And I mean, I when I watched their defense play last week, to me, it looked like he was the only guy out there hustling at times. But when Alden Smith is your best playmaker and hasn't played football in five years, and that's sure. the best player on defense, what does that say about you? Mm-hmm. And, and granted, Alden Smith, when he left football, was a tremendous player. We know the story. But I don't think anyone expected him to just pick up and just play as well as he had and be the best defensive player. But, yeah, I think the the whole combination of the, the guys that they have up front and, 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 and Jalen Smith should not – I don't know what he's thinking this year, but he is not the same player. And to take it another step further, when you start blaming the system and you've been paid, like Jalen Smith has been paid, when Demarcus Lawrence has been paid, you start pointing fingers, I think you got to really look around and see what the the problem is. Because before, when all this started before, you know, the code, when they got the the system and everything, remember they made the comment that, uh, you know, we're – predictable and that in Rob Marinelli's defense that they know what we're doing. Well, they wanted a more extravagant, more of a complex defense. And now they're complaining after four weeks, after the number one, you know, the defense has given up more points in the National Football League. Now they're blaming on the system. But I'm, I'm with you. I'm just as uh, surprised as you are about the lack of pressure because you know what? You, you're compromising. So if you're not going to play complementary football, you got to have one area of that and it's not going to be the secondary it's not guys uh it's going to be the guys up front and they're not doing it up front to help the guys in the back end kyle four games in a quarter of the season gone what are your takeaways so far well i think tony said it really well whenever he talked about the contract and the expectations the the whole reason why fans and, and and really those who cover the team are so frustrated right now is because of the expectations that the defense had. And, and Zach even brought it up with the additions. You, I mean, you look at it, you have five guys on your defensive line that have had 20-plus sacks in their career. So it's not you're not just bringing in these guys off the street, not bringing in veterans who have had journeyman careers or have just bounced around the league. You're bringing in guys who have had success in the NFL, and then not to mention your, your big payment guys like a Demarcus Lawrence and an Everson Griffin who uh, should be at least playing at a Pro Bowl level. But I, I, once again, they haven't been. And that's where the disappointment comes in. That's where the, the I guess, frustration and anger from a Cowboys fan's perspective is, is aimed at. If they were not expected to do well, you wouldn't really hear about the complaining. Maybe you could talk about the secondary. Secondary wasn't really expected to be one of the better units in the league or better units on this team even. But because they have at least seen some improvement, Trayvon Diggs most notably, you are not as unhappy with that defensive line. I think overall the defensive line has been the most disappointing part of this entire team because you have the Everson Griffins, the Demarcus Lawrences of the of the world in there, and they just haven't shown up outside of really Alden Smith. Yeah, Tony, you know, Demarcus Lawrence after the game had some really you know, stern comments, called the defense soft including himself. What what was the motive behind that? As a former player, what was the motive behind that? Was that frustration? Was that him trying to get his guys fired up? Was that just, what what do you think caused that in, from him? Well, I think as a player, you think that you're going to hear it anyway, so you might as well just be there. <laughs> and you got to you got to call a, you know, a spade a spade. It, it it really is something when you First of all, when you give up almost 10 yards at one point per carry, eight yards per carry, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a will that you got to inflict, you know, during the game. You have to, there's got to be a certain point in the game where, you know, things are, you're not playing well, but then you got to pivot and change things up. And whether it's, you know, running games and, or running, you know, slants or just blitzes and things that you can kind of change the energy up and the momentum, um, those are the things you have to have success with, and they're not doing that. And and look, I think that, I mean, he, he called it right. I mean, I'll give him credit for that. But what are you going to do about it this week? I mean, you got the Giants. I mean, it's a perfect example. This is the great, the greatest prescription for that being soft is the New York Giants. Now, if the New York Giants <laughs> have had, what, had scored two touchdowns in the last four games, I don't know. And, I mean, this is the remedy for you. There's no Saquon Barkley. I mean, they this is setting up for what they need to do is get over that softness. And I, I think that, again, I think these guys, uh, I hate to say it, uh, they, they have 
to me, they are so, um, they've been labeled superstars because of the star, because of the brand, because of what the Cowboys have done. And really, really haven't, this whole thing hasn't come to fruition because there has never been any consistency on the defensive side in the last two or three years. And, and I think as a player, that's what you tell yourself. Yeah, I'm going to come out. I'll admit it. Yeah, we were soft. We got our ass kicked. I mean, look at the stats. We don't need to say anything, but you're going to you're gonna have to get it anyway. But the thing is, I mentioned the pivot on that and really just try to get over that. And it's got to be a state of mind. I mean, when I watch this team defensively, there is no energy from the beginning of the game. I don't know if it's, you know, I've been to the last two games uh, at AT&T Stadium, and there's, not, there's only 25,000 people in the stands. I think the Cowboys, are the, the defense, are, they're part of the, the, you know, part of the crowd that doesn't show up because there's no energy. And to me, that becomes a state of mind. It becomes infectious. And if you need to turn it around, you got to have to create this momentum. And that's all you got. And I don't know. I, I know one thing, and I know I'm getting long with, your, with this answer, but I know one thing. Whatever was, was tip of the iceberg is when Od Odell Beckham Jr. ran that reverse, and there's five or six guys around standing around. Now, I cannot stand that. I mean, they tell you to run to the ball. And even if you have, even if you know you're not going to get there, at least make a constant effort. There was four guys. Alden Smith didn't play, you know, he didn't, you know, he may have lost an edge and containment. But he redirected him. But four or three of those guys were trailing. There was no hustle in that play. And to me, that's the thing that shows up even more. It's just the heart to play. Yeah. Tony, it's it's funny that you said the the prescription um, for the team is the Giants. I do a, a podcast on DallasCowboys.com with your former teammate, Nate Newton. Yeah. And he said the pharmacy <laughs> is coming to town on Sunday, that everything that ails the Cowboys is in the oh, form shoot. of the Giants. So He knows all about the pharmacy, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> let's take our first break. I we'll, love my man. We'll talk about those Giants coming to town. And, Tony, we were so excited to get into the defense We'll spend a little time with you and find out what you've been doing here lately. Let's get into some Dak Prescott talk. There's so many things to cover. We will be back. You're listening to Cowboys Crosstalk on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network.
back, back to back. SWBC Mortgage's Cowboys Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Back, back to back. SWBC Mortgage's Cowboys Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Broadcasting live. SWBC. Zach, visit SWBC.com to learn more, and you can start your next adventure I'm there. on it. SWBC.com. Love you it. got it. You got it. Tony, that is an awesome picture of you behind you, by the way. That is amazing. When when was that taken? What game was that? I, I thought you were talking about my Oklahoma MOU Sooner shirt. I, have on. <laughs> I can't believe you're wearing uh, that after this. I week. think this. I, yeah. Well, hey, well, look, the last I'm, two. I live and die crimson red, right? Um, actually, that's after the uh, the NFC Championship game in 1992. That was after the game. Um, it was muddy. I mean, you're talking about elements before the before the game and the way they prepared the field. It was almost like we're on top of a mulk. I mean, that was how much rain was out in Calvert time. But that was that was after the game, man. I had my helmet on and I had my battle armor on, and I just so happened someone captivated that picture. It's really cool. What what have you been up to? What is what has Tony Casillas been doing lately? Well, you know, I do some media contributing. I actually do a podcast. It's called the Seven Five Zero. It's called I'm Blogging the Boys, and we cover nothing but cowboy content. I actually start my own podcast, uh, which is going to premiere uh, October 13th at 7 p.m. First guest is Drew Pearson. Uh, but my show is going to be more because I talk about anything, man. I don't talk about politics, but we'll talk football. But we'll talk about life, you know, popular culture, you know, just cool stuff. And so I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I hate to say this, man. I, I turned in my, my young card. Well, I'm not young now. <laughs> Officially old, I had knee replacement four months ago, so uh, I've been recovering from that. And you know, I'm just trying to stay healthy. I'm trying to defeat age, man. But uh, I, I got two kids. You speak in Oklahoma. Uh, my oldest, my youngest, uh, my, one of my twin uh, twins. My son is at Oklahoma, and I have a daughter that's uh, his twin sister is at Arkansas. So. Just trying to figure out enough to pay for them to go to college, man. You got two at one time, man, <laughs> brother. <laughs> it's tough. I need, I need to, I need someone to ask me. and said, you know what? Uh, you need to come back and play. And I said, well, you know, I know I can't do that, but I just like to go out for one warm up, one pregame, because if I went out for pregame, that means I'd be get a game check. So <laughs> that means I would be set, especially if I was making. You know, the defensive line money. But yeah. That's been keeping me busy, man. It really has. <laughs> well, good. Well, good. We talked about defense last segment. Let's let's flip over to the offense. Dak Prescott, I think, since he's been in Dallas, he's he's progressively gotten better. He, he had that one year where he kind of was stagnant, maybe took a step or two back. But he's creeping up into that top ten quarterback in the league conversation putting up just stupid stats this year. A lot of people are saying they're hollow stats. Or you're playing from behind. Zach, let's, let's go to you first. What is your assessment of, of Dak? Is he the quarterback of the future here? Do they just need to just pay the man, get it out of the way? Or you know, do you need to see a little bit more from him before you sign off on that? No, I saw all I needed to see about two years ago. I think they're two years late on mm -hmm. paying Dak Prescott, and now they're going to have to uh, pay him about $10 million more than they would have originally had to pay him. So, you know, I think they're behind on that. I, I, I don't know. You know, Dak's having to play near-perfect football for this team to have a chance to win. Now, the one caveat is, you know, the turnovers. And, and that's not all on him. Certainly, the offensive line plays a factor in that. And Zeke's put the ball on the ground as well. And that also factors into the conversation we had earlier with the defense. You know, the defense hasn't been helped at all in terms of necessarily starting with good field position. I think there was a stat that 20% of opponents' drives have started in plus territory, so on the Cowboys' side of the field. But Dak's been absolutely brilliant. I think he's absolutely the guy here. But I don't know necessarily that the organization's convinced, or else I do think they would have gone ahead and paid him. I mean, you look at the track record with quarterbacks here in Dallas. They didn't hesitate to pay Tony Romo. Tony, you're well aware of how Troy Aikman's career went. So, you know, with Dak, I, I do think he has something to prove. But to me, and to I think a lot of Cowboy fans, he's our guy. Kyle, you paying him? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm right there with Zach. I think they should have done it after the 2018 season in order to get that done. Maybe not two years late on paying Dak, but I think in terms of the money that you're going to have 
saved on the back end, it would have been nice to pay him two years ago because of uh, really, like you said, he's not even just creeping up into that top 10 quarterback conversation. I think he's in it firmly and he's trying to get up into the top five. Now there's a couple quarterbacks up in front of him that are younger than, or maybe not younger, but right around the same age, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson that are in that conversation and just have better rosters or at least better success around them as as of late. But I think overall, Dak is a, a good enough quarterback to get you to the promised land. And if that's the case, you pay the guy and you move forward with it and build around him, especially at the age that he's at. He's still got a long career ahead of him. You've shown the kind of numbers that he can put up, even though I know, like you said, some of the argument is the fact that it's it's hollow stats. I don't think that's necessarily the case 100%. Sure, some of the back end of it, whenever you're in this comeback mode and you're, you're playing against soft defenses, there's going to be more stats put up. But he puts up plenty of stats in the first three quarters in order to make that a, a, at least a legitimate case. Yeah, Zach, you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about Troy. Mm. Tony, you played with a pretty good guy on Sundays. You got to see it firsthand up close and personal. What's your what's your assessment of, of Dak so far, this far in his career? Well, I agree with you guys. I think you probably should have paid him in 2018 or you know, paid him this year uh, because I think the price of poker is going to be a lot higher for him. Uh, hey, look, whatever you want to say about the, the stats are skewed because they're coming back, well, that's because he has to. He's got to be a one-man band, so to speak. And, and look what he's what he look what he's working with his offensive line and you know and I know there's a lot of injuries in the National Football League but essentially no running game the defense as you mentioned the stat I mean the offense hasn't started beyond the 50 and just from a ridiculous stat they don't able to flip the field um, so he's he's really really having to play take his game to another level in saying that I, I think the I think a lot of people I th- and I saw someone and. It's one thing, so some of the social media comments I don't read is that someone made a comment about, oh, they shouldn't pay Dak Prescott because he threw an interception in the last game. And I don't know, that wasn't on Dak. And I think people, they, they want to associate. I think you have to have the, the armor, you, or you got to have the, the, the rings, got to have the, the, you know, the championship games. And I think hopefully Dak will get to that point to be able to get this team. But it's not going to be just on him. It's got to be other things that we've seen. I mean, you know, this team could be 0-4, but hadn't it been for Dak and bringing these guys back, I mean, they wouldn't have had a chance to win at the end. But in saying that, um, I think he's – I think people measure him off Russell Wilson. When Russell Wilson has the football, the dude's going to be something special. I mean, there's only three or four guys like that mm-hmm. and in the National Football League, but most of the guys are top 10 quarterbacks in the National Football League or above average. They're pretty good. And that's where Dak Prescott is now. It's just now it's just about what's going to happen this point forward. You know, how they're they going to get better. They're going to give up 40 points a game. I mean, that is going to be the caveat to this whole picture. In. But I agree with you guys. They should pay him. Kyle, th- this team is carried over from last year. You got a new coaching staff. You kind of expected the offense to come out, high-powered offense, and start quick. Mm-hmm. They've been getting behind early in games with, largely due to turnovers. What do you think they need to do to jumpstart this thing, to get out, get ahead of a team and not have to play from behind every game? And isn't that the question? That's the million-dollar question right now. <laughs> I mean, if we could answer that immediately, we would be on the coaching staff most likely. But I think whenever you, you talk about this offense, they're good enough to, to get out early. We saw it in the Cleveland game. I mean, they were down 7 to nothing. Cleveland came down and really smacked them in the mouth early, mm-hmm. got on the board 7 nothing, and then almost in an instant – Dallas was back up 14-7. to But that's when you don't take your foot off the gas and you, you don't start pressing. You, you just keep doing what you're doing. You stick with the game plan. We saw it also in the Atlanta game. Whenever they were down already, you stuck with your game plan. You continued to run the ball efficiently with Zeke. You allowed it to open up the play-action pass, and then ultimately the comeback happened. And by the way, kind of going off of Tony's point about Dak Prescott, I don't think without Dak Prescott you're in those games at all. I don't think no, these end up being no. blowouts and not even just close games that you're having to come back. There's no comeback without Dak Prescott for all of those saying that they're empty stats. Those empty stats are there, quote-unquote empty stats, are there for a reason because he's able to lead them back. But I think early on you got to hold on to the football. Like Tony said, you can't give your defense short fields because other teams, good teams rather, are going to take advantage of that. And you've played four good teams to start the year. They took advantage of it, and that's really been the difference in this offense being – categorized as one of the best starts in history versus a one and three start. 
All right, fellas, let's take our next break. When we come back, the Giants are coming to town. We'll talk about that. Tony, I want to get your take on what you think about this coaching staff so far, both offensively, defensively, and special teams. We're not used to this aggressive play calling here in Dallas for the last, what, eight, ten years. Like, I want to know what you think as a former player. Like, do you like it? Do you not like it? Do they need to tap the brakes a little bit? We'll get into all that and a little bit more when we come back. You're listening to Cowboys Crosstalk on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network. Back to SWBC Mortgage's Cowboys Crosstalk. WBC Mortgage's Cowboys Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. my office okay. this is my old man temple this okay. is the stuff that i look at and remind myself hey i used to do something <laughs> unique <laughs> it's all old man <laughs> uh, well it looks good man it looks it look you look good for an old guy too by the way hey i appreciate that you're welcome hey you're so welcome. can i just tell you something i got very humbled yesterday i yes. played in the golf tournament up in oklahoma supporting barry switzer's uh, uh sooners in need and we played at the OU golf course, which is a fabulous, unbelievable golf course. Well, I'm playing with the four other guys who are pretty good golfers. And as I mentioned, I just had knee replacement, so I hadn't played any golf, so I really wasn't gonna just gonna chip and putt and all that. So about three holes into the round, the guy said, Hey Tony, 
you can hit from the up tees because of your age. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> That's when I'm like, damn, I'm an old bleakity blank. And the bad thing about it, I, had, I was up about 50, 40 yards, but I couldn't hit the damn fairway. So it didn't really matter anyway. But, man, that hurt. That hurt a brother, man. Oh, man. I'm <laughs> sorry. Fantastic. If we were in it's person. It's all good. Hey, man. It's we, all good. We'd hug it out if we were allowed to be in person. <laughs> so. Before I get your take on this, Tony, Zach, I want to throw it to you. Yeah. There's been some – I'm not complaining. We complained the last eight years about play calling and how predictable the game was and things like that. So I'm not – I'm not complaining at all. Some of our fans, I'm just going to say, you know, be careful what you wish for. You know, this has been a very, very aggressive play calling season. What's your take so far on the play calling in any aspect? I like uh, being aggressive. I, I think it's a welcome change here from the previous regime, and uh, we'll get to see a little bit of how that works on Sunday with the offensive coordinator of the New York Giants and kind of how lack of aggressive he might be. But uh, I like it. I mean, even in the Atlanta game, I loved the first decision for the fake punt. You know, the execution was just poor, but the play call was right. You know, if Chris Jones makes a better throw, that's a conversion, and you end up moving the chains there at midfield. Now, the second one... You can go ahead and uh, second guess a little bit on a fourth and five. You kind of run it up there for three yards. I don't know that I love that one, but overall, I, I'm for it. I, I like being aggressive. I like keeping the opposition on their heels. And, you know, you saw it work with that fourth down supersonic laser blast that Dak threw to Amari Cooper for the touchdown was beautiful. So t to me, it's a welcome change. And I think that's something that this coaching staff, there's certainly some negatives, as we've pointed out so far, but that's something that's been a positive for the first month of the season for me. Kyle, thoughts? Yeah, same thing. I, I don't think you want to have a, a conservative play caller whenever you're in crucial moments of the game like that. And I agree with Zach. Whenever you talk about even special teams-wise, some of the quote-unquote blunders that you've had throughout the first four weeks of the season could have very easily been highlights from a special teams perspective if you just execute a little bit better. And maybe that comes with time. Maybe, uh, I mean, I think already the offense has learned from the aggressive play calling. Look at what they did against Cleveland. Three straight touchdowns, three straight converted two-point tries afterwards, even uh, going back to the first couple weeks of the season, you didn't really have a ton of success with a two-point conversion, and they were able to do that in three straight drives against Cleveland. I think the aggressiveness is going to pay off, and ultimately they'll get used to it as the season goes yeah. along. Tony, as a player, do you appreciate the the aggressiveness? If, if you were on this team, are you like, yeah, let's let's go for it, man. Let's do it. Or are you like, oh, th if this doesn't work, we've got <laughs> we're in a hole. Like, how do you? Uh, what you that's the point. It's like any play. It's a, the more aggressive you are, we'll be aggressive. But if you guys don't make plays, we're not going to dial up a blitz. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to gamble and go on, go for it on fourth and five. Because incidentally, I, I don't know. They may be going for it on fourth to ten if their defense can't play any better. And so that's kind of an indictment on how there's not much confidence in them. But I mean, without a doubt, offensively, I, I, the play con has been really good. I mean, Kellen Moore or. Whoever, you know, Mike McCarty's got his thumbprint, I think that they've done enough uh, really to uh, to be able to – I mean, last year, this didn't happen. I mean, the, the way they score points and able to climb back and, you know, different parts of the game are amazing. And I think special teams really – when you look at the mistakes that they make, uh, the turnovers, you mentioned the turnovers. You know, Dak, you know, they turn over – you know, turned it over twice against Cleveland, and, and Cleveland was able to cash in with 14 points. You can't do that you know, against a vulnerable defense. And uh, but I think the the special teams. I mean, John Fossil. I mean, he was supposed to bring in this really, you know, extravagant, and he has in some of the play calling. But when you look at Tony Pollard, some of the, the decision making he's making really, really is costly. When you come when it comes to 10. 15, 20 yards when you're really trying to gain some type of momentum and, and field position. So without a doubt, man, I, I think that it's better on offense. But again, defensively, you know, if they're not talented enough and they can't, uh, you know, really ha uh, get off the field, then they're going to take a lot more chances because right now just playing conservative is not getting the job done. Yeah, talking about Tony Pollard on special teams, C.D. Lamb has been a really bright spot on punt returns. Yeah. But I tell you what, he looks thin on that 
on that field next to those other guys. He looks like a, a sheet of paper that's about to blow away. And when he got lit up that one time, I'm like, okay, Ooh, experiment's over. Yeah. Let's, okay, yeah. put him, like, what Throw do you whoever got? Whoever else you can out there. Yeah. Let's, yeah, what, Cedric Wilson back out yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah. What do you guys think? Should should they leave him out on special teams? Should they try him out at kick returning since Tony Pollard's been, you know, fumbling the ball, having issues? What do you guys think about that? Mm. Oh, I, man. I think, Go for they're it, one Tony. And three right, they're one and three right now. I think you cannot – I mean, this is – I hate to – it's a must win. Mm-hmm. I mean, you lose to the Giants, then you got Arizona on Monday Night Football. I mean, you need something. So, you can't really go in and be more, you know, cautious about a playmaker, especially when you got someone back there that's really costing you a really valuable guard, valuable, valuable yards and really just the, the field position. Uh, and so I, I think CD, yeah, I think he's very elusive and he's not used to being, you know, to having that role, but the guy's dynamic. And I think the thing also is that he's, he's going to make, if he makes better decisions, that's what it all comes down to is being able to think about that. And maybe Tony Pollard will, will change that around, but I'd give him an opportunity considering the record right now. Zach, what do you think? Yeah, it's like that scene in The Water Boy. You can't hold anything back. It's the mud no. bowl. You know, at this point, you're one and three. You got to go out there and try and uh, win this game. Uh, uh, your first divisional game versus the Giants. I like CD Lamb back there, but I do think you're starting to see him become more and more important offensively. I think he's kind of already leapfrogged Michael Gallup as the number two receiver on this football team wow. behind Amari Cooper. I think you're, you're starting to see that every single week. Dak's looking at C.D. Lamb just a little bit more, and he's uh, he's becoming a pivotal role in this offense. So, you know, you kind of have to balance that a little bit because you don't want the risk of injury, but then again, you can't play scared. So I think it might come down to situationally. If you need a big play, you put him back there. But if you have some other options that you like, and to your point, Tony, you know, I think preseason, one of the things we missed on, at least for my show, the nosebleed seats, was let's get Tony Pollard back there. Tony Pollard hasn't looked good. Mm-hmm. You know, that fumble against Seattle, uh, you end up getting the safety. That was an absolute, you know, game changing, altering mm-hmm. play. Yep. And you can't afford those kind of mistakes, especially with a bad defense. So, you know, the the returning aspect of it is one where I think down the line it'll be a situational deal. But right now, trot him back there. Let's go. Yeah. And I, I completely agree because whenever you look at C.D. Lamb and what he brings to you as a punt returner, not only is he your most exciting punt returner and the one that could potentially flip the field for you uh, most likely, he's also your safest punt returner. He makes it so effortless. He doesn't make mistakes. You mentioned decision making, Tony. He's a, probably the best decision maker you're going to have as a punt returner. Didn't and he's it. only a rookie. And I mean, he's that's, only a rookie. That's a crazy exactly. thing. Yeah. Even as his, his stock continues to grow, and he's only one of six NFL players in history to have at least five receptions in his first four games. And, and you're talking about leapfrogging Michael Gallup. Sure, Michael Gallup's still making plays, but I, I think, like you said, Zach, in terms of a constant piece that Dak can t- continue to throw the football to, he's starting to grow as a player, and he's starting to grow as in, in, his, in his importance on this offense. But I think overall you got to trot him back out there, even with that all on the line, because those – couple of plays where he's going to break it open and he'll go 20 or 30 yards or even at one point, hopefully he takes it to the house. It's going to be oh so much worth, more worth it <laughs> whenever he gets back there and he makes a play for you. Let's tr- it would be nice just to, to know what it's like to start a drive in the opponent's oh, that territory. Would be that oh, would be nice. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, Tony, I know you're chomping <laughs> at the bit, so we're going to go ahead and, and for the next couple of minutes, we'll just clear the table and give you a chance to talk about your Sooners. Mm. C.D. Lamb, you you probably followed his entire career. What can we – I mean, he's met and exceeded expectations that I had so far in this season. I thought he was going to be good. I thought the learning curve was going to be a little bit a little bit steeper and it was going to take him a few more games to catch on. But he, he looks like he's got it figured out, man. What can we expect out of this young guy? Well, I think he's a hard worker. I think he's humbled. I think at Oklahoma, that's one of the things that he did. He ran exceptional uh, routes. He's disciplined. I don't think he has a big head. He's grounded. Uh, and I think he's, a, he's an old football soul. And I think you, you know, say that about a rookie coming to the National Football League. You, you can't really, it's hard. I mean, it's, it, that doesn't happen a lot. And I think we all expect it. I mean, we, they were able to draft him at 17. It's like, man, this is a home run. And man, I, I tell you what, he has knocked the ball out of the park and there's just, there's just more to come. And and I think when you watch him against Cleveland, man, when he was 
just running down the field and you watch his routes. And I think for a young guy, you just don't know how good that is to be that concise with routes. And with that, you get more confidence in your, you know, in your quarterback to go to him. And ultimately, he's just open. So I, I'm, I'm, I thought he'd be good. Uh, I thought it'd just take, you know, steps for him to get some momentum going and be able to, you know, work some continuity and get confidence from Dak. But uh, he's going to get the ball because he is a playmaker and he doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. Let's take our final break of the show. And when we come back, the pharmacy is coming to town. The New York Giants, <laughs> Coach Garrett. We get to talk about Coach Garrett for the rest of the week on all of our shows. It's going to be so much fun. And we're going to talk about him, the Giants offense, the Giants defense, what we think is going to happen in the game. we got a lot to get to in the last few minutes of the show, so let's get to it. You're listening to Cowboys Crosstalk on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network. WBC Mortgages Cowboys Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco.
slide into your the second half of your normal spot here whenever we wrap this thing up in a few minutes. Yeah, we're ready to go. Ready to go? All As right. always. What you guys talking about You're tonight? Ready to go. Oh, man, we're going to open the show. All the things we got wrong through the first four <laughs> weeks. There might be one or two things we got right, but there is a laundry list of what did we miss on yeah. from our preseason predictions. Same. You are not the only one that got a lot of things wrong with this team the first four games. Kyle Yeomans over to my left and very special guest, Tony Casillas. From his man cave, office, old man room, as he likes to call it now <laughs> these days. So, Tony, the Giants are coming to town. How are they going to fix the Dallas Cowboys this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a, that's a tough prediction. First of all, the storyline is Jason Guerin coming back. And, right. you know, his offense has really struggled. Their whole team has struggled. You know, you lose uh, someone like Saquon uh, you know, Barkley, I mean, that's detrimental. And so, you, so right now, record wise, you got run, you know, team that's uh, hasn't won at all this year. And you got one team that's one and three. And I think they're tied for first or in second in the FCE. So, I mean, there is hope. But I, I think that this is a game that you just, I mean, you got to take your, you got to take it out on them. You know, your frustration and anger, whatever that may be. I mean, this is a perfect, opportunity and you know i always tell this to people and i and, and i was on the other side of of the line of scrimmage uh, when i was before i came to dallas is that people especially if it's an nfc east game people they get ready to play the cowboys you're going to get their best shot uh, i know a lot of people that aren't cowboy fans that you know that you know they hate the fact that people still label them as the best you know america's team and all that but People get ready to play the Dallas Cowboys when they come to town. And so they're going to get their best shot. And I'm sure Jason Garrett would not like not under to, you know, put 35 points up against this deep type of defense. Uh, and so I don't know. I think that it's going to be an interesting outcome because of what we've seen in the first, you know, four weeks of this, this season. And I think it's a game where, again, you have these games that you – it came, comes at the right time time that you're expected to win you're expected to go out there and win and and yet the confidence in cowboy nation and around uh don't have much confidence in the cowboys so i think it's coming at a great time and this is an excellent time to work everything out and if you have any heart whatsoever to leave it out there on that field against the giants Kyle, what do you think is going to happen this weekend, man? I, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. You talk about frustration. You talk about being embarrassed. It's time to get back on the, the saddle and, and take it out on a division rival. Like you said, just when the Giants are coming to town and you think the Giants are going to give their best shot, do you think that maybe the Cowboys are about time to see their best shot at a division rival coming across a field from you? I think this is the week you start kind of seeing a little bit of a turnaround because, uh, and I said this earlier on a radio call, but... I think this this ship can be righted really quickly. You you get a win this week. You, there's a toss up game on Monday Night Football against Arizona, who didn't necessarily look great this past weekend. That's going to be a high flying offense. But if you can somehow squeak out of there with a win, you're three and three. You've got back to back divisional opponents, and then you face Pittsburgh in Week Nine. You can get back to where you're not only in control of the division, but really running away from it by the time you face Pittsburgh. And so I think really right now this is where the turnaround needs to happen you need to come out we need to see this defense play like all pros even for the guys that aren't all pros you need to look like all pros against this defense or against this offense Zach do you do you believe Kyle when he says you can fix this defense this week or is this defense just bad and you're gonna have to put up 40 <laughs> points a, a week to, to be in a game I do think this defense is bad and they probably <laughs> yes. will still need to put up 40 points but I also think the Giants <laughs> offense is pretty horrible as well so <laughs> You've got two ugly, ugly sides of the football. They're going to meet each other. And for the first time, you got two tackles that are pretty susceptible. The Giants are trotting out there. We know Cam Fleming is a fan base here very, very well. And then their uh, rookie, Andrew Thomas, has had a little bit of a rough start to his career as well. So maybe Demarcus Lawrence can finally get that first sack of the season that he's looking for. And Daniel Jones is one that will throw it to you. You know, we were thinking maybe last week Baker Mayfield, who's got some gunslinger in him, maybe the secondary could get an interception. This is the week. I mean, every single week, Daniel Daniel Jones is just literally hitting defenders in the helmet, in the chest. The question is, can we catch the ball? 
Mm-hmm. You know, how many times have we seen interceptions dropped? So they're going to have opportunities defensively this week. Can they capitalize on it? I think they finally will. I still think they'll end up giving up some points because they're not very talented. But True. ultimately, I think this is finally the game the Cowboys won't be playing three or four scores behind. And we can finally see them settle into a little bit more of a balanced offensive attack, feed Zeke a little bit. I think he probably has his best game of the season. Tony, was there ever a, a point in your career or points where things just weren't quite clicking on defense for whatever reason? People not in sync, people not playing up to their potential. And then you had a, a game like this one where you had a, a team you should beat, you should beat pretty handily, and it just set everything right, and then it kind of changed the momentum going forward in the season. Can you recall anything like that in your career? Or Yeah, I mean, there's the, the thing that with that that goes with that is that, I mean, there, there's certain times during the game, different, like if, if let's say last week, for instance, Cleveland, uh, they're, I mean, they're running all over you, but there's a couple of, possessions is a couple of you know drives that you were able to get off the field to give it back to the offense and they have not been able to do that uh it's just been you know it's just bleeding and i think i think there's something that i, I don't know i don't know if it's a, a talent i don't know if, i think you, you you can you can't coach the desire i mean these guys are paid being paid a lot of money so they shouldn't be motivated they shouldn't be motivation to go out there and do their job and play with some fire okay but I think that there's a pl- certain period of time in the season where you need to turn this thing around. And again, this is a, an example for them to do that. I mean, they're one and three. The fact that even think that they lose to the Giants, they're one and four. I mean, that's, to me, that would be blown up. I mean, that would be uh, all hell would break loose. But yeah, I think those guys, it's got to stay together. I mean, it's like anything. You, you, you first, you face adversity. Uh, you're, you know, whether it's technique, whether it's a physicality, I mean, you have to bring it together and, you know, you're expected to win. I mean, a lot of the games besides the Seattle game, the Cowboys were expected to win and we all thought they would. And even Seattle, they had a chance to win. Even the Rams, I mean, I thought they'd been the Rams, maybe Seattle, but all these games they had a chance to win, but their defense is not, has been very poor. So I think this is a good game to rebound. As I said, take your anger and all your frustrations out on, you know, Jason Garrett, and just just let it eat. <laughs> That's a good point. You lose this game, you're one and four. Thank goodness you're in the NFC East, arguably the worst the worst division in football right now. Kyle, is this a must win game? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I was asked that question in week two against Atlanta. It's like, no, this is not a win, must-win game. But this one I think is because, one, you, the last three years you've gone 5-1 and one in the division, and two of those three years you haven't made the playoffs. And so I think it shows already you have to win your divisional games to a, an utmost degree. Even when they're this bad, you still got to win your divisional games, and it might give you even that much more of an edge. So if you're 1-4 and four, and 0-1 in the, in the division by the end of this Sunday, you're going to see a little bit of uh, a little bit of trouble around the league, and I think that's something that the Cowboys have to avoid. Zach, must win? Yeah, it is. So got to take care of business within your own division. That's the easiest way to the postseason, especially with how bad it is in the NFCs. they got to go out there and handle the Giants, or else uh, it's going to get very, very bleak here in DFW yeah. on Monday morning. Yeah. Tony, must win, huh? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, I, you guys just mentioned it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it, you don't get a participation award playing in the NFC East, even if you have, you know, you're one and four and you're, you feel good about that. I mean, you're not going to feel good about yourself if you're one and four. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, that's just bluntly, you know, I, that's, that's going to be expected. So, yeah, this is a must win to turn this thing around. All right. Now, the final question of the show. This is for everybody. We'll go around the horn. Do the Cowboys, <laughs> do they win? This Sunday at AT AT&T Stadium versus the New York Giants. Tony. Yeah, I think they'll they'll be two and four after after what six o'clock on Sunday evening, hopefully. Yeah, I'm gonna go the Cowboys win. All right. Kyle? Yeah, Cowboys win by three scores. Oh no, I don't like the way this is going. I don't like the way this is going. It's gonna be three scores? (laughs) Yeah, three scores. It's not even gonna be close. Oh, I've, I've watched the offensive tape from New York. They should not score yeah, a whole lot of bad. points, even yeah. against this defense. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Zach. All right, yeah, Cowboys win. I'm not going to go off uh, Kyle there with the three <laughs> scores. I, I just don't have enough confidence in this team. But yes, they get the victory over the Giants, even if it's.
it's an ugly win. A win's a win. Yep. I am going to say the Cowboys win just for my own sanity and for sake of the show that I host on DallasCowboys.com because if they lose, it is going to be a long, miserable season of hosting a podcast for the next however many weeks. So just for my own personal gain, I am going to say yes that they win. So... Fellas, this has been awesome. Tony, thank you for letting us invade your home and and chat with you for about an hour. This has been great. Kyle, thank you. It's good to see you in person again, man. We've got some plexiglass here in between us, but good seeing you. Zach, good to hang out with you, man. Appreciate it. We'll get out of the way, and we'll let you have your your, your show. Thank you, Tony. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, on Cowboys Crosstalk. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!